taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Peter Dupas Peter Norris Dupas was born on 6 July, 1953, the youngest of three children. Born in Sydney, his family moved to Melbourne when he was young and they were considered an average Australian family. Both of his siblings were quite a bit older than him, so his parents treat him more like he was an only child. The first criminal act carried out by Dupas came on 3 October, 1968, when he was only 15 and still at school. The young Dupas had gone to a neighbor's house and asked if he could borrow a knife for peeling vegetables with. A strange request, but not something one would be worried about, his parents had probably sent him. When the female neighbor returned, Dupas took the knife and began stabbing her repeatedly inflicting wounds to the face, neck, and hands during the assault. When he was asked about why he committed such an offense later in custody, Peter Dupas replied that he didn't know. For the crime he was placed on 18 months of probation and admitted to a psychiatric hospital for evaluation. After just two weeks, he was released and treated as an outpatient. A year later in the October of 1969, the mortuary at Austin Hospital was broken into and two bodies of elderly women were mutilated. Using a pathologist's knife, the perpetrator had cut a curious incision into one of the corpse's thighs and although it has never been proven, it is believed that Dupas carried out this crime due to the same wound being inflicted on a later victim. A detective who interviewed Dupas in relation to a crime in 1973, would go on record to say, he is an unmitigated liar, he is a very dangerous young person who will continue to offend where females are concerned and will possibly cause the death of one of his victims if he is not straightened out. Those words would soon bear fruition in the oncoming year. On the 25th of July, 1974, Peter Dupas was sentenced to nine years in prison after an attack on a woman in her own home. In the brutal attack, Dupas had broken into the property and threatened the woman at knife point, before tying her up and raping her. During the offense, he also threatened the life of her baby to make the woman more compliant. The judge who sentenced Dupas for the crime, stated that it was, one of the worst rapes that could be imagined. Whilst in prison for his nefarious sex attack, Dupas came under the care of prison psychiatrist Dr. Alan Bartholomew who said with some certainty that, this youth has a serious psychosexual problem, that he is using the technique of denial as a coping device and that he is to be seen as potentially dangerous. It appears that there were various warnings from various sources, sadly nothing was done to deal with Dupas and he was soon free to continue his reign of terror. Around two months after Dupas was released from prison in 1979, the sexually deviant criminal carried out four separate attacks over a period of 10 days. These assaults ranged from malicious wounding and intent to rape, to indecent assault and intent to rob. By February 28, 1980, Dupas was back in prison for another five years. A report into his behavior, carried out at the time, stated that he was an immature and dangerous individual who shouldn't have been released on parole. This time there would be no early release for Peter Dupas, but in February of 1985, he had served his sentence and he was free to roam the outside world. This would have unfortunate circumstances the very next month. As a 21-year-old woman made her way onto the beach at Blagoe, Dupas left his car and followed her. Once he was close enough he launched at her with a knife sending the woman to the ground where he proceeded to rape her. After this offense he reportedly apologized to police saying, I'm sorry for what happened. Everyone was telling me I'm okay now. I never thought it was going to happen again. I only wanted to live a normal life. On the 28th of June, 1985, Peter Dupas received a sentence of 12 years for the rape at Blingoi. Unbelievably. He was released after serving only seven years. Even though a report had stated years earlier, that he shouldn't be considered for parole. 
Peter Dupas was out for two years before he instigated another crime. In January of 1994, a woman was held at knife point in a toilet block at Lake Ipilok. Her attacker was wearing a hood and had handcuffs and tape to bind her. It was only when her friends realized that something was wrong, that she managed to escape. After fleeing the angry group, Dupas crashed his car while making his escape and was subsequently apprehended. On the 18th of August, 1994, Peter Dupas pleaded guilty to false imprisonment and was sentenced to three years and nine months in prison. He was released in September of 1996, and he moved into a property in the Melbourne suburb of Pasco Vale. Nicole Amanda Patterson was a 28-year-old psychotherapist who worked with young addicts and as a sideline, she also used her home in Northgate as an office. This was in the hope of gaining enough clients and experience to open her own private practice. To encourage things along, Nicole took out an advert in the local paper to expand her client base. On the 19th of April, 1999, two of her neighbors heard a woman screaming at the Patterson residence, between 9 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. During the afternoon, Nicole Patterson's boyfriend made several attempts to contact her by phone, though none were answered. That evening, a friend who had made dinner arrangements with Nicole, called around and was perturbed when she noticed the front door was unlocked and the radio was blasting. Upon entering the property, she found the body of Ms. Patterson who had been morbidly mutilated. Nicole had been left on the floor, naked from the waist down and with her underwear around her ankles indicating a sexual motive. Small pieces of yellow tape were found stuck to her corpse and her handbag and driver's license were stolen, though these weren't the most distinguishing acts perpetrated by the killer. Her murderer had also stabbed Nicole 27 times in total, and removed both breasts with a sharpened blade, a truly disturbing characteristic. As investigations started, it was revealed that Nicole Patterson had arranged a meeting with a new client at 9 a.m. on the day of the murder. The new client was named Malcolm in her diary and also had a corresponding phone number, which was traced to an Indian student at La Trobe University. Further investigations into the student revealed that he had been offered laboring work by Peter Dupas, and that Dupas had access to the phone in question. On the 22nd of April, just three days after the murder, police swooped in and arrested Peter Dupas on suspicion of murder. He was formally charged the same day. Through the investigation detectives learned that Dupas had called Ms. Patterson on several occasions, which Dupas said was to help him with depression and a gambling addiction. He also further stated that he had cancelled the appointment on the day of the murder. This was due to Ms. Patterson saying that his problems could be worked through by himself. The investigators weren't buying it however, they theorized that the phone calls he had made were to ascertain how vulnerable the young woman was, and to gain trust and easy access. As he was being interviewed, officers also noticed scratches across Peter Dupas' hands and face, consistent with a struggle. When confronted over these marks, Dupas replied that he had been injured while working in his shed with a lathe, he didn't own a lathe. He would later change the story to passing by a protruding piece of wood in the shed, which then scratched him on the face and hands. More damning evidence was to come however when police searched Dupas' residence. At his home they found a ski mask, blood-stained clothing, tape similar to that left on the body, newspaper cuttings of the Patterson murder and a newspaper containing the advert Ms. Patterson had placed offering her psychotherapy services. With the considerable evidence against him, Peter Dupas was taken to trial, and on the 22nd of August, 2000, he was found guilty of Nicole Patterson's murder, earning him a life sentence behind bars. In summing up, Judge Frank Vinson remarked, the prospects of your eventual rehabilitation must be regarded as so close to hopeless that they can be effectively discounted. There is no indication whatsoever that you have experienced any sense of remorse for what you have done, 
and I doubt that you are capable of any such human response. At a fundamental level, as human beings, you present for us the awful, threatening and unanswerable question, how did you come to be as you are? Peter Dupas tried to appeal his conviction, but the appeal was dismissed. While serving his time in prison for Patterson's murder, Dupas didn't receive any reprieve from detectives who decided to dig into his murky past for more wrongdoings. They wanted to keep the monster behind bars. On October 4, 1997, a body was discovered under a cardboard box besides Clifford Road, Somerton. The remains were them of Margaret Josephine Moore, a 40-year-old prostitute who had last been seen alive in the early hours of the same day, in a Safeway supermarket. Ms. Moore had been seriously attacked. She had suffered blunt force trauma to her head, a stab wound to her wrist, lacerations to her arm, and bruising to her neck. More uncomfortably however, her left breast had been removed and placed in her mouth. At the time of this murder, Peter Dupas had been out of prison for little over a year and was no longer under supervision. A black woolen glove found at the crime scene matched his DNA, though he remained steadfast in his innocence and the case went to court. The trial for M. Smar's murder lasted three weeks and some of the most damning evidence put before the court was the similarity in the Patterson and Marr murders, particularly the removal and focus on the breasts. Although the jury were not aware that Peter Dupas was already serving a life sentence, so as not to instill bias, they found him guilty of the murder. On August 16, 2004, Peter Dupas received another life sentence. During sentencing, the judge stated, It is clear both in the present case and from your previous convictions for rape and like offenses, that your offending is connected with a need by you to vindicate a perverted and sadistic hatred of women and a contempt for them and their right to live. Nicole Patterson's sister spoke after the trial, stating that Dupas was, the most evil predator, a psychopath, a true evil predatory, cunning repulsive person. Once again Peter Dupas attempted to appeal his conviction, and once again he was denied. Another cold case was now brought forward by detectives who were still peering into Dupas' background. On November 1, 1997, a 25-year-old woman named Mercina Havigas was murdered as she visited her grandmother's grave in Faulkner Cemetery, Faulkner. The alarm was first raised by her fiancé after she fell to meet him, and he would be the one to discover her dead body in an empty gravesite at 4.35 am, on November 5. She was just three plots away from her deceased grandmother. Investigators believed that Ams Havigas had been attacked from behind while she tended to the flowers, ultimately dying from the massive injuries inflicted. During the assault she had been stabbed 87 times, with most of them focusing around the breasts, although there were wounds to other areas also, including the neck. At the time, Peter Dupas had been living in a house on Cone Street located close to the cemetery and witnesses placed him at the scene that day. Due to these new leads, an inquest was held into Havaga's murder. At the inquest, the coroner heard that there were nine witnesses who placed Peter Dupas in the cemetery on the day in question. That there was a hotel across from the cemetery that Dupas frequented, and that his grandfather was buried in close proximity to the crime scene. The inquest also heard that Dupas attempted to alter his appearance after the murder, and that he lied about a facial injury he received at the time. He was also identified from police photographs by a witness who says she saw him minutes before the attack, within 20 meters of the murder scene. A senior detective added to this by telling the inquest that a car Dupas was using at the time, was sold to a friend in the month following the young woman's murder. The car had since been destroyed. On the other hand, a forensic pathologist testified that he couldn't tie the murder weapon or perpetrator in this crime, to those of the Patterson or Marr murders. This however, was due to insufficient evidence and was certainly not exoneration. 
Dupas solicitor also argued that his client was only suspected due to his vicinity to the crimes and his propensity to use knives when attacking women. Stating that his prior convictions were the only reason detectives were investigating him in relation to the case. This may be true, but it is also exactly how suspects are formed in such cases. On August 1, 2006, the inquest was closed as Peter Dupas was formally charged in relation to the case. After police began questioning their suspect, a break would come in an unusual way on the 11th of September. 2006. A disgraced Melbourne lawyer who had been imprisoned for drug trafficking, came forward and told investigators that Dupas had confessed to the Havagas killing while gardening in prison during 2002. Andrew Frazier, the disgraced lawyer, described the confession as such. We regularly used to find stuff hidden in the garden, drugs, weapons and other stuff. I once found a homemade knife and called Dupas over to show it to him. He took it off me and started handling it, almost caressing it in a sexual way. Dupas then started saying Mercina, Mercina over and over with this strange look on his face. I was certainly left in no doubt that Dupas murdered Mercina. This wasn't some sort of jailhouse confession where somebody has gone in and sat in a cell one night and had a brew with another prisoner and somebody has allegedly said something. It's a lot stronger than that. Dupas and I spoke regularly, just the two of us. This was over months and months that he was talking to me and confiding in me. There was one occasion when another prisoner came up to us when we were gardening and started abusing Dupas. This prisoner was yelling at Dupas saying you killed Mercina, you killed Mercina. After he had gone, Dupas turned to me and said how does that cunt know I did it? After Fraser agreed to give evidence against Dupas, he was released two months early from his own prison sentence and was given the chance to apply for the $1 million reward. This was for information leading to a conviction in the Havagas killing. Peter Dupas was yet again taken to trial, this time for the murder of Mercina Havagas. The first jury was dismissed over a technicality before Andrew Fraser took to the witness box and provided his testimony. For which, he would soon be able to claim a portion of the million dollar reward. On August 9, 2007, Peter Dupas was found guilty of the murder of Mercina Havagas. At sentencing, he was given his third life sentence that was to be served with no minimum term, effectively ruling out any form of parole or freedom. Over the next three years, Dupas lawyers successfully negotiated an appeal and attempted to have the case stayed permanently, due to the high publicity in the saga. They failed on this count and Peter Dupas was tried and found guilty again of Mercina Havaga's murder. On the 26th of November, 2010, Peter Dupas was again sentenced to life in prison, without the possibility of parole. Other than the offenses he has been tried for, Peter Dupas is suspected of various others, including that of Helen McMahon, a 47-year-old sunbather who was murdered on the beach at Rye in February of 1985. It is believed that Peter Dupas was out on license and living in the area at the time of the attack. If this was to be the case, it is possible that it was his first murder. Whilst serving out his sentence of life behind bars, Peter Dupas has attempted suicide on various occasions. Prison staff however, have described him as a model prisoner.